I want to welcome you to module four, Civil War Technology. And then we're going to answer the question, how, was the Civil War the first modern war? And we're also going to look at the Battle of Gettysburg. So we're going to start off this week asking that question. But, and before we can answer that question, was the Civil War the world's first modern war? We have to define the term or qualify the term modern. What is modern to some may not be modern to others. Uh, for example, there are some that would think that the, the VCR is a modern technological implement used for uh, viewing the movies, uh, home movies, films, and such. But when you compare a VCR to a DVD player, you realize that the VCR is not modern after all. So as we get started, I want to briefly discuss one of your required handouts that you should uh, have access to in Canvas, written by A.D. Harvey, <clears throat> in which he asks the same question, was the Civil War the world's first modern war? Certainly many famous historians have labeled it so. Harvey mentions three in his article, Major General John Frederick Charles Fuller, T. Harry Williams, and John Walters. All three of these historians argue that the Civil War was indeed the first modern war, but I think their reasoning has to do with the fact that the Civil War falls between the first and the second industrial revolutions, which made it possible for the manufacture and use of what would have been considered modern weapons at that time. Things like torpedoes, submarines, uh, the telegraph, railroads, and rifled muskets all lend credence to the argument that the Civil War was the first modern war. But the only problem with this is that some of these items existed prior to the Civil War. <clears throat> For example, submarines were used uh, during the Revolutionary War, not to a great degree, but they were. Uh, railroads, steamships, the telegraph, those had all been used during the Crimean War, which was fought in 1853-1854. Civil War soldiers started using the smoothbore musket, which replaced the flintlock in 1840. And the way the smoothbore musket worked, uh, since we're talking about Civil War tech, I thought it would be interesting for you to know what was involved in actually loading one of these weapons during the Civil War. And so the way it worked was a Civil War soldier would remove a pre- made a uh, paper cartridge which contained a, a specific amount of black powder, gunpowder, along with a lead ball. And you can see a picture of what it looked like here on the slide. <clears throat> From their cartridge pouch, they would remove this pre-made ready package, if you will. They would then take the cartridge, uh, and you can see a picture of it there on the slide, and they would tear it open with their teeth. They would then pour down the powder charge into the muzzle of the, the uh, musket, they would then take the, the round ball, they would place it on the top of the muzzle, remove the ramrod, which was uh, uh, positioned beneath the barrel, and they would ram that uh, uh, projectile all the way down to the bottom of the barrel. So you've got a, a bit of black powder at the very bottom. Uh, on top of that is a, a, red, a, a round lead ball. They would then take a, what was called a percussion cap, uh, a little tiny metal cap with a little bit of fulminant of mercury, a little explosive charge in it. They would then affix that to a, uh, a hollowed out part on the, mus on the muzzle's firing mechanism. They would then cock the hammer and they were ready to fire. So this system was known as cap and ball and the whole procedure involved nine steps and it allowed the average Civil War soldier to fire off about one round every uh, two minutes or so. Now, by the war's end, Civil War soldiers had access to a new weapon system uh, called the rifled musket. Basically, it was the same thing as a musket. It looked the same. The only difference being that inside the bore, the barrel, if you will, there were these uh, uh, helical grooves that had been carved into the metal of the muzzle. And the, this was designed to be used with a projectile called the mini ball, which was designed by Claude Mini. A cylindrical soft lead projectile had rings cut into the base of it, which allowed it to, to grip the rifling on the inside of the bore, as you can see on the picture there. And what that did was when the soldier fired the mini ball out of the rifled musket, it would put a spin uh, on, the on, the, on the projectile, much like a football when you throw a, a spiral pass. That's, that's going to be more accurate. Same thing with the rifled musket. And so when this soft lead projectile exited the muzzle of the rifled musket, it would expand in flight and would create devastating results on those uh, that were struck by it. A great many Civil War historians make the argument that due to its increased accuracy and lethality, the advent of the mini ball was basically the catalyst that forced Civil War combatants to begin digging in. 
digging entrenchments, uh, which was a clear departure from Napoleonic tactics. But there's little evidence to support this. Uh, most soldiers fired their new rifled muskets at about the same distances that they had their previous smooth bores. Uh, but there's two notable historians that I want you to be familiar with. One of them is named Earl Hess. Earl Hess has written <clears throat> uh, several volumes on Civil War tactics, digging entrenchments, fortifications, and the like. And the other gentleman's name is Patty Griffith. And both of these historians argue that they argue the other side, and they give evidence that the average range of a Civil War firefight was really not that different than when each side used smoothbore muskets. And this was primarily due to a lack of emphasis on marksmanship training. So while in, you know, an, an 1861 Springfield rifled musket may have boasted an effect, effective firing range of, say, 400 yards, the average firefight during the Civil War happened at 100 yards or less. Uh, typically, 68 yards is the average. And there were a number of reasons for this. First, number one, most Civil War soldiers were accustomed to the smoothbore musket, which only had an effective range of about 100 yards. Most soldiers felt more comfortable shooting at the enemy within this range. Also, the Civil War, like the Crimean War, was a black powder war. Before the invention of smokeless powder in 1884, firearms produced this, this acrid, thick uh, layer of blue-white smoke that soon enveloped the battlefield and made it difficult to see the enemy at long ranges anyway. According to Patty Griffith in his book, Battle Tactics of the Civil War, Quote, the arrival of the rifle musket actually made very little practical difference on the battlefield, end quote. So we can conclude that it wasn't the use of the rifled musket that forced soldiers to begin digging into the earth, uh, by the way, which forecasted the great battles during the Western Front in World War I. Rather, it was the increased frequency of meeting the enemy in combat that forced men to dig in. Simply put, the continuous nature of Civil War combat caused men to dig in. <clears throat> now, the introduction of the Spencer repeating rifle in 1863 revolutionized small arms warfare, making it possible for a soldier to fire a round every time he worked the lever of the rifle. Made in both a rifle and a carbine version, the Spencer had a demoralizing effect on Confederate soldiers. The Spencer could fire a magazine of seven copper rimfire cartridges in 30 seconds. Now just a quick explanation on the difference between what's called a rimfire and a centerfire cartridge. With a centerfire round, the firing pin of the rifle or pistol strikes a primer located in the bottom of the brass casing, setting off a minor explosion which ignites the gunpowder inside the casing, forcing the projectile out the end of the barrel of the weapon. Now a rim fire <clears throat> round is one in which the firing pin crushes the rim of the casing, which is where the primer is located. Even when Confederate soldiers captured Spencers, uh, they proved useless because they required rim fire cartridges that weren't made in the South. Over 94,000 Spencers were purchased by Union troops during the war by the federal government. Another repeating rifle to make its debut off the assembly line was the famous Henry rifle. Patented in 1860 by Benjamin Tyler Henry, it was also introduced in 1860, but it didn't make it into the hands of Union troops until about mid-1862, right before the Battle of Antietam. Now, the Henry rifle fired a very powerful 44 caliber rimfire cartridge, which was exclusively made in the North. The rifle was frequently used by, by scouts, by skirmishers, uh, flank guards, and raiding parties rather than regular infantry formation. With a magazine capacity of 15 rounds, one Confederate officer is credited with the famous phrase, quote, it's a rifle you could load on Sunday and shoot all week long, end quote. Because the South didn't possess the ability to mass produce firearms like the North, <clears throat> the South relied heavily on British imports like the Whitworth sniper rifle and the, or the pattern 1853 Enfield musket. The, um, the pattern 1853 had seen extensive use during the Crimean War. But the South did produce their own rifles in limited uh, quantities, like the Fayetteville rifle, uh, the Richmond rifle, but these were basically copies of the Springfield rifle musket uh, that was made and used in the North. Sharps rifles were used by both sides, but those were large-bore single-shot weapons, mainly designed to bring down big game. 
<clears throat> now the sharps was great for long range hunting but it wasn't really practical for infantry units one advantage the sharps rifle did possess was that you could load it while lying prone an impossible task with a musket and a cut down version of the sharps was popular with union and confederate cavalry alike and when it came to handguns Single action revolvers were the rule, as double action revolvers were not developed until 1899. The Colt Firearms Company uh, manufactured over 200,000 revolvers for the Union Army, the two most widely used, most prolific being the Colt 1851 Navy. I actually had one of these at one time and regrettably sold it, I wish I still had it, and the Colt 1860 New Model Army Revolver. The 1851 Navy was so named uh, for the engraved naval battle scene on the cylinder. It was chambered for the 36 caliber and fired a, a, a round lead ball. Although primarily a Union sidearm, the Confederacy captured thousands of 1851 navies or manufactured copies of Colts. The Colt 1860 Army was chambered for the 44 caliber round and saw service in all branches of the service in every theater of war. <clears throat> the 1860 Army was very reliable. Uh, and the larger caliber made it somewhat more effective than the 1851 Navy. Its only drawback uh, was an open frame, which made it a little bit weaker. For the Confederacy, there was a gun culture that pervaded the South, still does today, uh, more so than in the industrialized North. And one of the first things that a Southerner grabbed when he left home was the family handgun. To supply most of its handguns, the Confederacy captured Union sidearms, or they imported others from European manufacturers and, and made their own, most of which were Colt clones. There were only three reputable Confederate firearm companies in the South during the war. There was the Griswold and Gunnison Company, the Leach and Rigdon, and the Spiller and Burr. Probably one of the most commonly carried rebel pistols was the 36 caliber Griswold, made by Griswold and Gunnison. Around 3,600 of these were made, and if you compare the Griswold to the Colt 1851 Navy, it's basically identical. The only difference being that the frame for the Griswold was made out of brass uh, in place of, of steel because it was harder for the Confederacy to get steel than it was brass. This also made it weaker than its Colt counterpart. <clears throat> Another Confederate favor on the right there was the, the Lamatt revolver, and this was a French import. It could fire nine successive shots followed by a single burst of buckshot. The 40 caliber Lamatt packed greater firepower than any other Civil War handgun. Now the hallowed weapon of the great classical warrior is always the sword. The sword held a romantic appeal, especially for Confederates, and in the Civil War the saber served both as a weapon as well as a status symbol of rank. The most common sabers were the Model 1840, and the Model 1860 Cavalry Saber, which were highly favored by horse soldiers, or cavalrymen, or cavaliers, all means the same thing. Unlike medieval combat, Civil War soldiers rarely, if ever, engaged in classical sword fights, because why take a knife to a gunfight? The most common method for employing the saber in combat was to ride down an enemy foot soldier and then strike down at him <clears throat> from a higher mounted position. Soldiers from both sides of the war also carried fighting knives uh, for close quarters combat. The more commonly fielded knife was the famed Bowie knife, named for Alamo hero Jim Bowie, who supposedly designed the knife. Now, considering all the weapons that we've looked at so far, the one thing that they all have in common is that they were personal weapons, issued and used by the individual soldier in combat. Therefore, they required the soldier to wear field gear. And since as far back as soldiers have engaged in combat, field gear has been a common theme. If you think uh, to the, back to the Bible and, and the account of David and Goliath, we're told in the Bible that David retrieved five smooth stones from the brook and then he put them into a script. He put them into a essentially a, what would have been a cartridge bag uh, from, from ancient times. So soldiers have always carried field gear. It's a very common thing. Field gear for both the Union and the Confederacy was pretty much the same, about the only difference being the letters U.S. or C.S. stamped or embossed on it. It could also be worn on the soldier's infantry belt, this, this gear. Uh, the primary piece of field gear worn by both sides was the cap box and the cartridge box. 
Uh, these two items were essential for a soldier to load and fire to work his musket. The cap box was made of leather, worn on the right side of the waist belt, and contained copper percussion caps, as I mentioned a little while ago, necessary to fire a musket. The model 1855 cartridge box was also made of leather, was larger, often worn uh, with a shoulder belt and with a metal buckle with US or CS on it. It could also be worn on the soldier's infantry belt, but was rarely done so. The 1855 cartridge box held 40 pre-made, pre-packaged rounds of either 54, 58, or 69 caliber. And so when a soldier opened the Model 1855 cartridge box, it, it, he found it divided into two compartments. In addition to the cap and cartridge boxes, soldiers also wore a pattern 1851 haversack, which was basically slung over the sol shoulder. Uh, the Army haversack was used primarily to carry extra food, personal hygiene items, uh, or keepsakes like family photographs. The model 1855 knapsack was another item of issue to all foot soldiers <clears throat> and was worn on the back with leather carrying straps over both shoulders. And in this knapsack would contain things like spare clothing, extra socks, maybe extra shoes, uh, mess equipment, fork, spoon, maybe a mess tin, personal items, maybe a wool blanket, maybe even a shelter half. Of course, no soldier's field gear would be complete without some way to hydrate himself. The Union Model 1858 Canteen was made of tin and used a cork as a stopper. And this tin can canteen was also popular with the Confederates when wooden canteens of Southern manufacture were not available. Officers typically carried both a saber and a pistol, which was kept in a leather holster and worn on the leather infantry belt. So if you want to take a look at this picture, and uh, you may need to look at the slides in Canvas to get a little better look at some of these slides because of, uh, of the inset of myself talking to you on the, on the corner there. But like today, individual armies wore distinctive uniforms during the Civil War. Uh, these were wool uniforms. For the Union, the North's economic advantage over the South enabled federal soldiers to be uniformed in a more standardized manner than their Southern counterparts. So if you look at Billy Yank there on the left, you'll see what, what was a typical Union or federal uniform. And as you can see, this Union soldier pictured on the left, he wears the, the standard Kepi, K-E-P-I, or forage cap. He's wearing a blue enlisted man's wool sack coat, light blue wool trousers, and shoes that were called brogans. Around his waist, you can see he's got his cartridge and his cap box. The haversack is visible slung over his left shoulder, and he has his knapsack on his back, with the wool blanket roll. On his left, you can also see the canteen and a tin drinking cup. He also has a bayonet on his left side. Now on the right, you see the Confederate soldier dressed in what's called butternut. That was a color. Confederate uniforms initially varied greatly due to a variety of reasons, such as location, limitation on the supply of cloth and other materials. And while typically issued a gray wool uniform, but they were, but by 1863, most rebel soldiers were wearing butternut coats. The average Confederate unit would have included soldiers dressed in a, really a variety of uniforms, and most, many, didn't even have shoes. <clears throat> like, like Union troops, enlisted Confederate soldiers also wore kepi hats, but many wore plain cowboy hats as well. Another type of uniform seen in the Civil War was the Zouave. Z-O-U-A-V-E, the Zouaves. The Zouave hailed from the French Army and were originally recruited in the 1830s <clears throat> from native North, native North African troops, uh, but the units were soon made up entirely of Europeans. The Zouaves enjoyed a reputation of being recklessly brave on the battlefield, so certain American units adopted their style of dress and tactics. They were members of an elite unit with an esprit de corps which bounded them together as a family with the regimental commander known as Father, among the Zouaves, as the family head. They were also bound together by their distinctive dress. The Arab-inspired short jacket that you see there, the baggy red trousers, and the fez hat were all key parts of their identity. The 1st Zouave Regiment in the Civil War, the 9th New York Volunteer Infantry, uh, formed up in, uh, on April the 23rd, 1861. Other cities and states in the North uh, and the South also saw the creation of Zouave units. Now, like World War II reenacting, 
Civil War reenacting is a hobby that's really popular back east, not so much out here in the west. And this photograph that you see here shows a, a pretty accurate depiction of three average Confederate soldiers, what they would have looked like during the Civil War. Notice not one of them is dressed exactly alike. This photo shows uh, Union reenactors, and you can see more uniformity in their dress, uh, which is very accurate. The bugle on the top of their kepi hats symbolizes or shows that they are infantry. By the time of the Civil War, there were five basic categories of weapons considered to be artillery. Now, for those who may not know, artillery <clears throat> is a class of large military weapons built to fire munitions far beyond the range and power of what's known as small arms. Artillery dates as far back as the ancient Romans, uh, 400 BC, with, uh, with the ancient Romans using the ballistae, uh, the catapult, those would be considered examples of artillery. The first cannon in world history was used by the Chinese in the year 1350, and since that time, warfare has used cannons in some shape or form ever since. In the Civil War, field guns, or pieces as they were called, th these are synonymous terms for a cannon, <clears throat> were the most commonly used artillery pieces in infantry battles. There were also howitzers. Uh, these were short-barreled guns that fired shells at higher elevations over less range. There were mortars, similar to howitzers, but didn't have the range. And then there were guns called columbiads, which were long-barreled cannons that combined all the features of the aforementioned weapons. Now, a cannon was simply a brass or iron tube mounted on a carriage of two wheels. Cannon barrels were first made of brass, then steel to handle the stronger pressures. Cannons were categorized according to the weight of the projectile that they fired. There were three pounders, six pounders, 10 pounders, 12 pounders, and 24 pound guns. That doesn't mean that that's what the guns weighed. That has to do with how much the cannonball or the projectile weighed. So a three pounder gun fired a three pound cannonball. And like muskets, there were smooth bore cannons and there were rifled cannons. The picture that you see here is probably the, the most widely used field gun uh, piece or cannon during the war. It was the model 1857 12 pound Napoleon gun. Now to fire a cannon required a crew of about eight guys uh, called a gun crew or a cannon crew. And these eight men included the gunner. It consisted of eight men all told, all assigned numbers for crewing the gun. Every guy had a job to do and we'll go over that in a second. A trained and disciplined battery could come into action and fire its first shot in well under one minute, which is pretty impressive when you think about it. Depending on the terrain, a 14-yard space was maintained between cannon crews. So the way this worked, and we're looking at a, at a cannon, sort of an overhead view here, uh, a, a gun or a cannon crew included the gunner. He would be uh, number eight there. Uh, the gunner, or the number eight man, ordered load. He would say load, and the number one man sponged the cannon bore with what looked like a giant q-tip called a rammer. He would dip the end of this thing in water and then sponge down the bore. And the reason he did this was if any kind of lingering embers from the previous shot that was fired, uh, he wanted to extinguish that because he's getting ready to put a, a fresh charge of gunpowder down the barrel. And if there's burning embers in the bore of the cannon, when he does that, the results could be disastrous. It could ignite a fresh powder charge before the crew is ready for it, basically killing everybody. <clears throat> the number two man then took a round from the number five man, placed it in the muzzle of the gun. The number one rammed home the round, basically used the same device that he did to sponge the bore. He just turned it around and used the other end to ram the round home, which was a, a one-pound bag of black gunpowder affixed to a, to a projectile. The number three man then held his thumb over the vent, a hole in the top rear part of the cannon, where the friction primer was inserted into the primer bag. The gunner then stepped up and sighted the cannon. When the gun was loaded, the gunner gave the command, ready. And number one man, number two man, stepped clear of the muzzle. Number three man then punctured the powder bag with what was called a vent pick. The number four man attached a lanyard to a, the friction primer inserted the primer in the vent, number three man covered the vent with his left a thumb while the number four man moved to the rear. At the command of fire, number three stepped clear of the barrel, number four yanked back on the lanyard and boom, the cannon fired. <clears throat> the re and this whole process was repeated 
until the order for cease fire was given. So a, a pretty meticulous process, but all told could be done in under a minute. In addition to the gun itself, another two-wheeled vehicle was, uh, was part of this operation called the Limber, which was manned by the number six and seven man. The limber basically was uh, designed to, to carry spare ammunition and tools. Contained uh, 50 rounds of 6-pounder, 32 rounds of 12-pounder, depending on the gun, <clears throat> and other various pieces of fixed or semi-fixed ammunition. Additional tools and ammunition were carried in two to three chests uh, on the caisson, which also held spare wheels and tools. Here's a picture of the caisson. When attached to the limber, the caisson became a four-wheeled carriage that was drawn by a six-horse uh, team. So each cannon battery consisted of the gun, the cannon, uh, the limber, and the caisson, drawn by a team of about six horses. And so when it was pulled together, it looked like this little toy here. Each cannon had its caisson, its limber, which made it a six-wheeled vehicle drawn by six horses, and it would have looked something like this. Now, not all cannons were Napoleon guns. Uh, rifled guns, called parrot guns, were used to fire long-range shells to knock down masonry, walls, or to demolish forts. Concerning cannon ammunition, there were five types of projectiles uh, that were used during the Civil War. And we're going we're gonna to stop here, we'll pause, and we'll, we'll take it up again here in a second, and I'll describe those different types to you.